Thank you. Thank you for this, uh, for uh, I would say, very powerful presentations. And so th this is what will happen. I would like to allow you to uh, respond to each other, to answer each other, and perhaps then we'll open the floor for questions and remarks. But, but before that, I felt that the presentations raised a very rich range of questions. And, and I just wonder if it's not too rich on some level. In, in the following sense is that, just to borrow, to paraphrase a very famous literary title, it's unclear to me what we talk about when we talk about sanctions. And, and I, I think it was especially clear in the last uh, two presentations, I don't think it's really about sanctions. It's about other things, important things. Um, and, and I feel that there is some dichotomy here between the, two, the first uh, pair of speakers and the second pair of speakers. BDS is very, very specific. It's about Palestine, Israel. It's about a social, political movement. Um, while the first two presentations really address the, um, uh, the international order, nation states, uh, international organizations. Um, and so on and so forth. So, so, so one question that I would like to raise is, should we talk, uh, talk about or think about sanctions in any unified monolithic way? Uh, as the last speaker said, it's a mean. I mean, we, we, we could have a, a conference about war. There are all kinds of wars, some legitimate, some not legitimate. We also saw that there's a great level of complexity to the th two uh, themes of the conference, the issue of efficacy. Uh, can we measure it? Perhaps not. Um, how to actually understand the motivation behind uh, sanctions, uh, the explicit uh, motivations and the hidden motivations. And then the whole array of normative questions, the ethics, the politics, the legitimacy, and also the fate of uh, what I would call, for lack of a better term, the innocent bystanders. Who, who suffers? because of, of sanctions. So, so the question should, is it worth it uh, to think globally about sanctions in the sense to, to, to do for sanctions what some did for wars? Can we think about just sanctions as a subject matter for uh, international debate and theorization? Or this is really not terribly practical. And, and we need to look at each case uh, at the end of the day, sanctions are just war or politics by other means. Um, so you can answer this question, which I'm not sure is very practical itself, or you can respond to other panelists um, if, if, that's, if that's what you would like to do. I actually think that Nima answered your question about what is it. So, so this is not really about territory. This is also about the future of Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, and, and should be acknowledged as such. Uh, the, the, the future of the occupied territories is, is just one aspect of a much larger uh, set of questions. So, may I respond to your more general question? Okay, Actually, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm, I'm new to the debates about sanctions in general, so I don't know whether what I'm saying is out of left field or commonplace, but it's just what occurs to me. Um, I don't know how it's possible to generate a general principle of sanctions. I, I can't imagine what it would be, and, and I offer a test case to, to test this. Um, we now understand, as some people did in the 1930s and 40s, although um, now virtually anyone who's historically literate understands that the Soviet Union um, murdered more people uh, than, uh, than Hitler. And yet, I doubt there's anybody in this room who thought it, that the United States should have sanctioned Stalin uh, during the period 1941 to 45, because there was a political judgment made, which was, I think, thank God, uh, a just judgment, namely that it was important to have Stalin as an ally. So one could have made a case, and there were, I think, uh, isolationists and, and uh, right-wingers of various kinds and some ultra-leftists who argued that uh, this was the wrong decision. Uh, certainly fascists of all kinds have argued that the United States should have sided with Germany and, and, uh, and, and gone to war with Hitler. Uh, I once met a supporter of uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen who, who argued this point of view quite vociferously. Um, 
but uh, my point is that it, it, it is necessary in real world politics to do things which are in, in some ways morally reprehensible and yet necessary. And uh, therefore, I can't imagine what a universalist principle of sanctions would be. Let me put it more simply. I think sanctions are simply another way of conducting foreign policy. Bahana, would you like, you raised this issue of equity, of some, some cases are subjected to, or some uh, nations are subjected to sanction, to impose sanctions, others are not, and the question is whether there should be some equity, some sort of general principle, or organization that has the legitimacy to impose sanctions. Um, yeah, actu actually, the, 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 the question that I was, I was trying to raise was, Get closer to it. Can you hear? Yeah. Now, the question that I was, I was trying to raise was precisely that. If we acknowledge that this is just an instrument of foreign policy, that there is no other high flaunting moral or other principles that should be uh, the basis upon which sanctions can be measured, then by all means, that becomes a discussion about specific cases uh, based on specific foreign policy. Um, um, uh, interests of whoever is um, sending these sanctions on, 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 on the target. Um, the problem you have when you have that is when you start to think about sanctions without any moral basis, that it is just an instrumentalist uh, issue is, then you are not going to get a buy-in. I mean, it just depends on um, um, whoever is powerful and whoever can circumvent that particular sanctions, and then, then uh, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. Just, it just matters whether you are a good friend of whoever is um, powerful enough to, to send sanctions on. Um, now, my fear is in, in that kind of brave world, then to talk about some kind of norms of behavior at an international level, that there are certain norms that every country has to follow, just simply falls apart, right? I mean, because it just all depends on... Um, and, and, and my fear is, if that is the case, if that's how we want to treat it, then, uh, then don't, don't presume that sanctions are going to create some kind of a brave new world where we all have certain common values. We don't. Then it becomes whoever is powerful at any one time. And uh, now China would be powerful as the economy um, mm -hmm. grows, and then it would be a completely different... Uh, so, so you basically made the argument, I think implicitly, that uh, historically thinking uh, sanctions have been the, ultimately a tool for uh, buttressing the, hege the American hegemony and the hegemony of capitalism. Uh, it's, you know, if you look at the, 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 the you know, it, the issue is not about dictatorship, the issue is not about human rights. Yes, so the, the nominal thing can be human rights and democracy and things of that sort, but in reality there are other, you know, you can't be a dictator and be very privy to capitalism and accept, you know, the IMF and the World Bank based policies, then you are okay. I mean, you are, you, you know, you are not, mm -hmm. you know, so if that is the case, um, it raises a whole host of questions about our world, right? I mean, you know, we started the United Nations and this international relations on the basis of concept of sovereignty and um, sovereignty implies that each country can do whatever, whatever he, that country wants in, within its territories, then all of a sudden, no, 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 there are certain unacceptable behaviors that should be governed by some kind of international mm -hmm. norms, right? That's, so we're moving into that accepted territoriality, which was the basis upon which the UN established, to this post-territorial uh, kind of environment where, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have sovereignty because it matters whether you accept certain uh, international rules of behavior. The, 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 the post-Soviet period seems to usher in that kind of world, right? right? You know, it's no more territoriality that is important. Yes, I mean, it's, it's going to take a while, but in terms of values, at least, there is this presumption that we are moving into a larger, more acceptable uh, value system. Now, the problem is, we are not. Then what? Then what is the basis upon which we are? Okay. That, that's what I don't know. Please. Yeah, I would say just a couple of uh, brief comments. So, uh, as 
it's true that the sanctions component of the BDS is not uh, prominent right now, but this reminds us with the, what uh, Arianair yesterday said about the South African experience. So it started as a boycott and a visit movement here in, in, in campuses and uh, uh, students, and then developed into uh, some pressure on the formal decision maker, makers who uh, uh, led to uh, sanctions. So it, it, it might be uh, a, a, a later stage. Uh, the uh, second point that I wanted to make is that uh, uh, Professor Gitlin mentioned the, uh, some kind of selectivity or hypocrisy on the part of some of the uh, BDS supporters that they ignore, for example, the butchery of the Assad regime. So I, for one, uh, in trend, have attacked the Assad regime and supported the Syrian revolution. So I think these generalizations should be uh, avoided to the extent uh, uh, possible. Uh, thirdly, um, Professor Gitlin mentioned the question of the right to return. Uh, even if 194 did not exist, each one of us, like, uh, according to IC the ICCPR, the uh, Social Covenant on Social and Political Rights, uh, we have a right to enter our countries. And according to the uh, international law and, and many uh, other and many domestic jurisdictions, uh, so long as you maintain an effective link with your country and there are un unreasonable impediment on your way that you cannot return, then you are still, you, you do not abrogate the right to return. You don't lose the right to return. Even if you were nationalized in another country, and therefore you are stateless, you still have the right to return. So even if 194 did not exist, uh, but the point here is not about legal aid, as you said, it's about accepting historical injustice and responsibility for that justice and the creation of the uh, question of uh, refugees. May I? Please. Uh, well, I, I, let me just start by saying that here are a few things I jotted down that Professor Sultani and I agree about. Um, it's always nice to establish that we there is some agreement in the room. The Israeli state is discriminatory. Talk, get oh, I'm the sorry. The, the Israeli state is systematically discriminatory. The occupation is oppressive. Um, Israel's support for apartheid South Africa during those years was disgusting. Uh, uh, the recent Supreme Court decision sustaining the prohibition against boycott advocacy is appalling. It should be rescinded. The Israeli right has become stronger, although I would say this is, doesn't work very well for the BDS argument since um, Israel is not improving under stress. But th those ra that raises difficult questions. But, but now I have a question, and I, and I mean this sincerely. Uh, um, let's suppose that the, uh, there was uh, some sort of uh, religious experience among Israeli Jews that led to uh, a rescinding of the Supreme Court decision the recent, that about banning boycott advocacy. Um, if the court reversed itself, or if the various provisions that you itemized, and I'm sure you could have gone on a, a great deal longer about discriminatory laws and constitutional provisions. Let's suppose that for the sake of argument, just hypothetically, that those were rescinded. Would BDS's view of the outcome of these tactics, the desired outcome, be any different? I mean, would, would, would the state of Israel, would the, provi the three provisions which I itemized, mm. by the way, I only brought up 194 because BDS does. I mean, I didn't pull this out of the sky. So if the three met? If, the, if, if these, if, if the laws, if, if unjust laws mm -hmm. were rescinded, if a discriminatory provision, I didn't write down the details, but you, you quoted something from the Israeli constitution. Okay. If that were transformed, mm -hmm. uh, and if, if the occupation ended, uh, I mean the occupation of the West Bank, uh, would, uh, would, would BDS uh, be willing to be more specific about what precisely it wants to take place politically in that territory? Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, uh, so first of all, I don't represent the BDS movement. I'm here on my uh, personal capacity sure. and I represent my views. I'm not part of their uh, committee. Uh, but uh, more importantly, they, they don't have, and there's a disagreement amongst Palestinian activists on what is the preferred, uh, let's say, post-conflict 
uh, resolution. So some would still want a two-state solution, some want uh, uh, a one state that it's on the South African model that is based on liberal individualistic rights, others like myself are in favor of a one state that is a binational state in which both uh, uh, groups can have an expression of their collective rights and can preserve their identity, so long as the yardstick is equality rather than uh, um, you know, um, uh, discrimination as it is uh, right now. So the answer, there is no answer. There is, and, and I don't think the BDS uh, um, and, and their website, they're not committed to any specific solution because there is disagreement on, on, on this uh, uh, question. Well, they're committed to, the, I believe, uh, unless something's changed in the last mm. few days, to those three items yes, that but, I mentioned. Yeah, but, the, but these don't... Which is, shall we say, calculatedly vague about what constitutes the Arab lands. No, I think, I think they are uh, pretty clear as, as far as I can tell. First of all, the occupation, as everyone recognizes, in 1967. So if that ends, if the refugees are able to return, and uh, thirdly, uh, uh, the a question of uh, Palestinians inside Israel, uh, full equality, then that seems to be very clear to me. I mean, we don't need to, take, to look for hidden uh, motives here. So the, the difficulty is this. So, Israel does not agree to these things because, or even to a two-state uh, model in that scenario, because it does not guarantee a Jewish state. That is a state in which there are privileges for the Jewish majority. Because if you give full equality to the Palestinians inside Israel, this means you have to eliminate the institutionalized uh, uh, discrimination. So Israel does not agree to neither two-state solution on that model nor a one-state solution for the same reason, because they want to maintain these privileges. But it's not, it's not a party, it's not a political party that seeks an, a very specific, concrete uh, uh, political program. It's only seeking to uh, uh, hold Israel accountable for specific violations of international law, and these are the, th the three main things. So your own personal view is that uh, it would be reasonable to be clear in the first provision about what constitute the Arab lands. That is to say that they are the West Bank uh, the lands occupied after the 1967 well, war, I mean, okay. with, with minor modifications. So there is the question of colonialism and what is the origin of the question. I guess you are referring to this. So uh, I think these are not necessarily inherently uh, uh, deterministic. That is, your position, so I think that yeah, Zionism is a colonial movement. And I think this was not a controversial question at the time. Herzl was bragging, if you read his book and his uh, as well as his uh, novel, about being uh, an outpost, a European-wide out outpost in the uh, uh, backward uh, uh, you know, uh, lands. And his novel, At Neuland, talks about the Arabs as black and dirty, etc., and scattered. Uh, and the only uh, Arab that appears there is the one who accepts the, uh, uh, the benefits of Jewish uh, uh, immigration. Uh, similarly, the uh, colonial administrators in Britain like uh, Churchill, who was the Secretary for Colonial Administration at the time, were also bragging. I mean, they were very clear about the colonial nature of, of this. Uh, and there's a quote I suggest that everyone uh, uh, Googles it about the dog in the major, that uh, uh, he talks about the natives in Palestine the same way he talks about the natives in the U.S. and the natives elsewhere, and that they are uh, dispensable. Once the, the dog in the major is no longer useful, it, he, uh, they, uh, it can be discarded. So. Today, colonialism seems like you know, has, it has a negative baggage, but at the time, everyone was bragging about it. It was not uh, a, a negative. But saying that Israel was born out of sin, if you will, that it was a, out of a colonial movement, in the same way that South Africa was a, out of colonial and movement. And the United States. And the United States and so Canada. So should all of these nations be abolished? So, 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 th so that's what I was about to say, if you were uh, patient enough. The fact that uh, I recognize it as a colonial uh, phenomenon does not mean that it follows X or Y, Z. So there is no specific concrete institutional. Uh, so the fact it was born illegitimate, illegitimately does not mean that those who were born, who were uh, inside this structure right now don't have any rights. They do have rights, and their rights are equal rights, etc. So the fact that I say it's a colonial phenomenon does not mean that I am uh, arguing that uh, you know, the, 
uh, British should go back from the US to Britain or something like that. Uh, but it is a settler colonial state. So in academic studies, Canada and the US and Australia are settler colonial states. And Israel is a settler colonial state like well, them. Although apartheid, yeah. South Africa was a colonial apartheid and Israel is a colonial apartheid. That does not follow so it was illegitimately born, but that does not follow that, you know, the Jews will be driven to the sea or some that of kind of... Uh, so I think you should distinguish between these uh, two things. I think I can make the same, cl uh, both claims at the same time, that it's, it is a colonial phenomenon, if academically uh, uh, studied, uh, but it does not mean that I don't recognize rights. And as you saw uh, in my presentation, also now when I said that I, uh, I'm for a binational uh, uh, solution, this means that I'm recognizing, but the colonial dimension, uh, I think, is the fact that uh, part of the maintenance of the Jewish majority in a Jewish state is the connection to the Jewish uh, diaspora, and the fact that the Jewish people sees the land as uh, uh, owned uh, by it and therefore cannot be shared uh, with us. I think this is the colonial dimension. Uh, there is no uh, difficulty with saying, you know, uh, we have religious connections to the place, but when you derive from that political uh, uh, privileges, then this is the uh, colonial uh, dimension. When you derive with that an ethnic cleansing process to drive the natives and uh, take their lands, and taking the lands was a major uh, component of the apartheid as well in South Africa, in the same way it is um, a major part of uh, taking the land. So that's colonization, uh, uh, that you take the lands, you drive the natives uh, out, and you build settlements instead of them, and you prevent them from returning. The fact that let, you say it's colonialism... Man, I'm, I'm amazed by how <laughs> civilized and erudite this discussion is. Uh, perhaps too civilized. Um, uh, but but I, I would like actually to open up the discussion and, and, and move closer from the details of the, the, uh, and the very rich uh, history of, the, of uh, Zionism, the state of Israel and Palestine to go back to the, sort of the general theme. And perhaps that's also the right time to open uh, the floor for questions and remarks from the audience. If not, I'll ask more questions. Please. If you can come to the microphone. Well, I think that as a Jewish American who has been uh, engaged in discussions and debates about Israel and then later Palestine for <laughs> most of my life, the challenge will be to narrow what I have to say down into uh, a couple of questions because uh, I, I found both the presentation of Todd Glitlin and uh, Professor Namir to be um, challenging and enriching. Um, to Todd Gitlin, I will say I'm a little confused about the way you sort of siphoned off the, the the Presbyterian divestment resolution from the BDS movement as a whole, because uh, I was very upset by Israel's incursion into Gaza, and as a result, I did something that I thought I would never do in my entire life, which is that I endorsed divestment from caterpillar bulldozers. I un, un, because to me, that's the clearest example of what I can ethically endorse. It's a very specific measure against house demolitions, which I find of civilians as collective punishment, which I find abhorrent, and a form of so corporate social responsibility. At the same time, I don't like what's going on in terms of the academic boycott component and a level of hypocrisy that I see in some of the UN resolutions such as the Zionism is racism resolution which was thankfully rescinded. So I, th I think that's the gist of what I have to say about Todd Gitlin's presentation. To Professor Namir, um, I was in your argument that it is valid to claim that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, I was struck by the fact that to me, you trivialized the issue of the right to vote 
because I can recall years ago hearing a black South African attorney speak about the oppression of apartheid and specifically mentioning that he did not have the right to vote. So isn't there a qualitative difference with, with all of the oppressive things that Israel does to in Israel proper to its Palestinian citizens, isn't there a qualitative difference in that they do vote? There is now a coalition between Israeli and Arab political parties that is developing, and there are Israeli Arab citizens who serve in the Knesset. Thank you. Uh, briefly, if possible, either of you. Sure. Uh, so, of course, I, I don't uh, trivialize the right to vote. I'm just uh, responding. So usually the right to vote is used as the main argument for why apartheid uh, analogy does not work for the Palestinians inside Israel, and therefore, uh, generally, or it's only limited to the uh, West Bank and, uh, and Gaza. Um, but um, the, uh, an important thing to remember here is that one of the reasons why Israel is able to claim to be a democracy and to give the Palestinians inside Israel the right to vote is because they are a minority. And they are a minority because of two reasons. One, ethnic cleansing, and two, the partition resolution. Through these things, uh, is Israel uh, grants the vote only to a minority of the Palestinians. I would like to see that all the Palestinians vote. All those whom Israel affects their life conditions should be able to have a say in their life conditions and to hold those who are uh, affecting their life conditions uh, accountable. So either you extend the vote to everyone or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an, an apartheid. Uh, so in this sense, the right to vote is limited to a small set category of the Palestinians. Secondly, uh, those who are given the right to vote are very marginal in the political system in Israel. There is no chance ever they will be a part of any influential positions in the government, the cabinet, or even the Knesset committees. And there is no chance that they will be uh, able to uh, promote any serious legislation that affects the Palestinian citizens' uh, status as a national minority or in terms of collective rights, because they will never be able to garner the votes. Even the Zionists, the left Zionists in the Knesset are opposed to that. So the only co uh, legislation that they were able to pass in a few years, uh, uh, in the past few years, were something like env environmental or these kind of things that are not about the status of Palestinians inside the same. So they are marginal and uh, uh, they cannot uh, influence. Uh, but, but the larger point was, it does not detract from the uh, analogy. Thank you. Just quickly uh, about issues that came up before. Um, to say that the state of Israel is to be a Jewish state is uh, vague. And, and I think it's a question that needs to be debated intensely. Uh, whether you mentioned the right, of the, the right of return for Jews, I have qualms about the right of return, um, especially in the absence of the right of Palestinian return. Um, I have, uh, I, by the way, uh, Israel is becoming less de democratic by the minute, and we could argue about which, which one is falling off the democratic horse faster, the United States or, uh, or, or Israel. That would be an interesting discussion, quite uh, depressing, I imagine. Um, um, but I, I think that um, the proper attitude here is to envision a solution and to argue back. What are the requirements of a solution? Now, if, if I could believe that the, the is, uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinians could actually live in a, in, you know, in a state of coexistence which was uh, peaceful and just, I have no objections. I can't imagine that these people who've been warring with each other for these decades are up for it. Should circumstances change and evidence become more... So how is that different? I mean, I'm not an Israeli, by the way. But how is that different from the apartheid in South Africa? For, you know, oh, about 90 years, they were oh, but, killing each other, et cetera. No, no, no. Well, because, because look, the circumstances, you know, there, there really were banter stands. There were no votes. The, the banter stands were, you know, puppet governments established, you know, by hereditary, uh, under the authority of, of hereditary chiefs. Uh, you know, the, the, the degrees of misery, the degree of inequality was stupendous. I mean, it's really 
no disrespect to the Palestinians, but the condition of black Africans in South Africa was egregious, you know, of, 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 of an order quite different here. Uh, not to say that uh, this current situation is just, it's extremely unjust. But I, I think, you know, I, I may here sound like a pious American liberal, but I, I do think if there were goodwill, uh, it would be possible to construe some version of a Jewish state which is livable, just as, by the way, a, a state on the West Bank would also be, in certain ways, discriminatory. For example, I don't think Jewish settlers have the right to stay there. And I, I completely sympathize with the desire of West Bank Palestinians to be done with them. Uh, you know, I, 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 uh, that seems to be elemental. So in other words, Jew, uh, Palestinians would have rights in the West Bank that Jews don't have, like land, land rights. I say, okay, fine. You know, I'm, I, I wanna be practical about this. Couple of questions, one from here and then we'll go here, please. That was quite a super panel, but I can only address a little part of it. Uh, I actually agree with the lady who just spoke uh, that, uh, uh, and I think you're wrong uh, about the, uh, the role of Arab politics in Israel proper. First of all, two governments uh, uh, of Rabin and, uh, and, and also of, uh, of Barak depended on uh, toleration by Arab uh, party, which is a very important matter in the parliamentary system. I mean, you live under a parliamentary system, you may have this problem very soon because the British elections may also require toleration by the Scottish party in that particular case. So that's a significant role. And also, I think the way you spoke about it disparages the achievement, or at least the potential achievement of the Arab list, which is, I think, a new force, and I think much, much more important uh, than BDS, by the way, politically, because I don't know what's gonna be the result of BDS, but an Arab Jewish movement, and I think the lady was exactly right. An Arab Jewish movement, potentially, that actually could be a game changer. Remember, ANC is a white black movement, uh, but in a country where the proportions are so much more black than white, here, whatever, however you can account them, the proportions will be much more even. So without Jewish mobilization, you're not going anywhere. Uh, a very interesting conference, really. Uh, analytical distinctions were made, which, which I think we should keep in mind. Uh, first of all, between effectivity and legitimacy, and, uh, and, uh, and Bernahu has supported uh, making that distinction. Moreover, he added some new categories because he then analyzed effectivity into, into, into uh, uh, different uh, uh, dimensions of it. Uh, I think that uh, he downplays the role of international standards uh, uh, because uh, although it is true that in a lot of settings uh, it is the American government that may decide or Western governments what those standards are, there are also some standards which are well established in international law. I mentioned just one, uh, the, the rule against annexation. Uh, the, the annexation of the West Bank by Jordan originally, the annexation of Gaza and Jerusalem, the annexation of uh, East Timor by Indonesia, uh, the annexation of Kuwait by Iraq, and the annexation of Crimea by Russia are all equally illegal, and it is important to, to keep in mind when actually things are applied. For example, the sanctions against Russia, which I don't support politically because I think they're not gonna achieve anything, uh, nevertheless uh, have the justification of a UN resolution uh, concerning the annexation attempt uh, at, uh, uh, in Crimea. So I would say that uh, uh, with you, uh, uh, although I love the analytics of your framework, uh, the way that you actually explain some of the categories, how they work, I have, I have some difficulties. And with, uh, uh, with the discussion uh, uh, between uh, Gitlin and Sultani, which is really, really interesting, uh, only bone I would pick is that uh, uh, in that case, uh, effectivity is not seriously taken into account. I mean, you really do have to explain uh, in a context, in context like the BDS, uh, and, and I don't think Todd really challenged this sufficiently, uh, how little effectivity this is gonna have in relationship to Israeli politics. I mean, he implied that things had been moving to the right, but the fact that this is used every day in Israeli politics, helping to polarize it and making, and making it more and more difficult uh, to form exactly the kind of Arab Jewish movement that you would need if you use the ANC model to which you're referring to constantly, I mean, this movement is not gonna help that. And I tell you, I give you one good example why it won't, because it's gonna be hard for you to get supporters who are closer to you than I am, even though I oppose the BDS. 
But I, I, the idea of the repatriation of two and a half million people, I tell you right now, it's not, not possible for me either. That this is, this is such a bottom line that we will not accept because remember, and you never mentioned this, there are at least one and a half million Mizrahi Jews who, were, who, who left the Arab countries. It is, this is a population exchange. This is not just expulsion, which there was. There was a population exchange like the Turkish Greek, uh, like with Germans and Poles and Russians. Uh, the, this is one of the great population exchanges of the century. You can't reverse it. And by making these claims about it, you're saying to Israeli Jews, we're not going to fight with you, and you're making the struggle that you believe in impossible. Andrew, thank you. Uh, um, wait, let's not respond uh, right now. I'm, yeah, I'm going to add to that. So. Okay, sure. just, just a sec. I'm, I'm, I'm being paid to look at the, at the yeah. watch. So we have another 10 minutes, and okay, if so Arian very, very will allow me to take another five minutes. So we'll, we'll get another two remarks, and perhaps we have a couple of minutes for last <laughs> thoughts. I'm going to okay. have to leave to catch a train. Okay. Okay, All right. so I'll try to be please. very, very quick. Um, I'm agreeing, um, well, let me put it this way. I'm slightly disagreeing with Andrew and agreeing pretty much with Todd's remarks. And Andrew mentioned one of the main things that I was going to point out about the Mizrahi uh, Jewish uh, problem. But I still want to address to Mary several questions. Uh, number one, I will take issue, although this may be a beating dead horse to an extent. But I will take issue that saying only proper academic discussion describing Israel as a colonial state is proper. What about describing Israel as a bourgeois national state? And instead of the South African, Canadian, um, Australian example, what about the Pakistani, Indian example in terms of the role of British colonials? And, um, the argument about there's no political justification, that could also be raised about certain aspects of the Palestinian claim. I mean, look at the creation of Jordan, which is completely a colonial creation of Churchill's and Britain. And I agree that for Palestinian rights, the whole question of the Jewish connection to the land is problematic, but yet, again, is it simply a religious connection, or were there political entities that existed even if they were 2,000 years ago? Okay, I'll leave it at that because... Thank oh. you. <laughs> Last question. Okay. Short, please. Short question. So I, I, I originally had three questions to each of okay. one, but maybe I just take one. Um, so uh, I didn't get from Nina Khrushcheva's talk how the functions really affected Russia. I know that their economy is um, in trouble and then that they change kind of their politics in some way, but still if you look at it that the target was, for example, to ease the conflict in East Ukraine and get like the Russians out of the country and, and so on and so forth, it didn't work at all. So, uh, and I think I just heard two days ago that there were like fresh fights in East Ukraine. So I don't know if it's really about the sanctions, but yeah, could you say something to that? Very quickly, very quickly. Actually, that was the point of my talk is that the expectations were grand. And that's why I cited George Cannon is that uh, you know, if we do expect Putin to get out of Crimea, good luck to us. But if we do expect Putin not to go further than he needs to go, then it's actually working. That's exactly what I was saying. And that economy that, uh, that everybody is citing is, is being um, on, on the downturn. It is indeed on the downturn. Once again, if the expectations were that the Russians were, turning, were going to turn around and say, Putin, get out of the Kremlin, that also was a very, very... Uh, um, I would say overhyped expectation because yes, if there were the blanket sanctions, which I was told many times, and I was actually a proponent of that, uh, so we as, as Russians were not going to travel, we are going to uh, lose our bank accounts, then that would have been an opportunity, but politically it would really was not possible. So to expect that the Russians would turn around and say Putin get out, it's not going to, and you know, we talked about colonialism, just one last moment, Putin really, very, I mean, he's a 
deeply brilliant man, I think, and KGB helps with that a tremendous amount uh, to know how to be brilliant in this regard. He's citing the West, well, what he says is that the West is doing the new democracy. What used to be colonials were going to bring uh, great results to, to, to the people, but in, in turn, what the West really wants is to put us down. So what sanctions did actually, the Russians said, fine, we are going to tighten the belts for a while and uh, we are going to oppose the West this way. But something that I keep re kept repeating in my talk is that if we don't expect five minutes, then it's actually going to work. The problem is that the expectations is we're going to impose sanctions and two months from now, it's going to be the same Kremlin. It's not going to be the same Kremlin, at least not for a while, thank you. I, I just want to respond very quickly to, to Andrew. I, I'm not by any means under valuing the importance of um, some kind of international standards. But as you say, for example, annexation should not be allowed. It should be, human rights is extremely important. I think it is, it is, it's an incredibly important thing that we should have as, as an international value. I think people should not be governed by brute dictators. I mean, I think it's a very important value. I, you know, my fear and my problem is when you have these standards, but they are you know, applied in such a way that um, you know, they are functional and subject to sanction in some places but not on others, then you lose that, that very critical, important value. That is what is happening and that's what my fear is. We are living a world without any basic values that has, that's going to be implemented equally, effectively everywhere. That is where my problem is. Last 30 seconds. Two minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Andrew had many points. Each one of them uh, needs a uh, long discussion. So I will, I will say just one sentence about each. Uh, the Rabin government relying on Arab votes, yes, that's why Rabin was assassinated, because the Oslo process relied on Arab votes. Since then and since 2000, there is a redrawing of the boundaries of legitimacy in, uh, in Israel. So it's, it's not going to ever happen. The joint list, uh, uh, I'm, I just... I just published uh, an article about the joint list uh, 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 titled The Fetishism of Representation and the Illusion of Influence. I don't see where you talk about the Arab-Jewish cooperation. The only thing that existed there is that one of the components, which is the Communist Party, they already had uh, a Jewish member, and the nationalists and the Islamists decided not to object to that because that was a condition for having the joint list. The joint list did not have many more votes than the uh, separate components had before the election, so I don't see that as, uh, you know, launching a new fo a phase of Arab-Jewish uh, cooperation. Uh, about effectivity and the question of refugees, uh, you say it won't happen now, and it's not realistic. Why? It, uh, first, it matters why it wouldn't happen. Because if the question is because you want Israel to maintain its the Jewish majority and therefore to maintain itself as a Jewish state, then this is the same reason why equality for me as a Palestinian citizen is not realistic and will never, never going to happen. And this is what we were told in the uh, constitution-making process uh, uh, a few years back. Uh, so I can't let go of the uh, principle of equality and my right to be equal just because I think it's realistic. Secondly, there's a difference between the right and the exercise of the right. So first of all, we need recognition of the right, and then we can negotiate if it should be exercised or not and by who and how. And thirdly, you can't ask the Palestinians to say now before negotiations and you know, before having a package deal with the uh, Israelis that they are abrogating the right of return. Because even if they eventually will uh, uh, compromise on the right of return, it has to be during negotiations and within a, a package deal of historical uh, reconciliation, not now saying you can't demand it, you can't talk about it, especially when it's grounded on uh, interest rate. Excuse me, Andrew, excuse me, you. everybody. I need to thank you all, and we need to start the next session. <laughs>